Hi guys, I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. Welcome to the Goop Podcast. Every Thursday, Goop editors will be sitting down with provocative thinkers, industry disruptors, and culture changers. I'll take turns interviewing barrier-breaking guests as we talk about shifting old paradigms and starting new conversations. Today's guest, Terry Reel, is a sought-after family therapist and teacher who has turned the traditional therapist-patient relationship on its head because he actually gets involved and takes sides. He is known for his work on male depression in particular and the way it can manifest in marriages. Couples often go to him during really tough impasses when they are on the brink of divorce and typically emerge from his office reconnected and re-engaged with a new perspective on their partner. People need to learn how to speak up with love, how to listen with generosity and not defensiveness, how to repair when things go off the rails. These are all skills that I teach every day. His unique therapy center, the Relational Life Institute, is in Massachusetts, though he offers training programs and workshops around North America. Terry's most recent book is The New Rules of Marriage. I talk about what I call normal marital hatred. And I've been going around the country talking about that for 20 years, and not one person has said, hey, what do you mean by that? Terry has a really brilliant way of shifting relationship paradigms. And today he's talking with our chief content officer, Elise Lunin, about why men struggle with intimacy, what causes romance to deteriorate, and how we can all strengthen our relationships. After the conversation, I'll be doing a quick round of Ask Me Anything. If you've got a burning or totally random question you want me to answer, hit us up at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. Before we get to Terry, though, let's talk about one of our partners. The founders of True Botanicals couldn't find clean skincare products that actually worked, and so they made them themselves without any of the toxic ingredients found in many conventional products like carcinogens or endocrine disruptors. Because the amount of toxins in conventional products is staggering, we created an ingredient screen for the Goop Clean Beauty Shop that's very hard to pass. True Botanicals passes with flying colors and even has independent clinical trials to back it all up. Now here's something we don't always think about when it comes to aging skin. It ages everywhere, not just on the face. The launch of True Botanical's new, totally unfussy two-step set for all over glowy skin is especially well-timed for short sleeves and skirt season. You start with a beautifully scented, lactic acid resurfacing body mask to gently slough away the dead skin cells that cause skin to appear dull. This leaves skin in prime condition to absorb the pure radiance body oil and goes well beyond what any lotion can do. It's full of antioxidants and essential fatty acids that hydrate and deliver nutrients. Like Goop, True Botanicals is a company run by women, women who believe we deserve better from the beauty industry. They wanna convince everyone that clean beauty is just as powerful as conventional products. To give their potent non-toxic products a shot, go to truebotanicals.com and type in code GOOP at checkout for a one-time 15% discount. Now let's get to Elise and her interview with Terry Real. You've created relational life therapy, which you refer to as RLT, which is a totally different model from conventional therapy where people sit on your couch and talk about uh-huh, their problems. Uh-huh. Tell me more about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you yeah. get in the mud, right? You yeah, pick sides. Quickly, quickly. Um, You know, here's what happened. I wrote uh, the first book on male depression that had ever been written back in the 90s. And I began getting calls from around the country saying, we're desperate, you know. And after about a year or so, the light dawned. And I said, why don't you come to Boston? And so for these couples on the brink of divorce that no one else had been able to help, I evolved a two-day relational intervention. We spent two days together. At the end of those two days, you're either on track or getting a divorce. And what I found is two things. One is I had a remarkable success rate. I'm not saying I saved everybody. I didn't cure them. But I did pull them off the ledge for the the, the vast majority. And two is in doing so, I broke just about every rule I had learned about how to do couples therapy. And I'll tell you what rules I broke in a minute. But being a teacher, I faded out and I started teaching what I was doing. And that became relational life therapy. Tell me what rules you're breaking. 
Well, first of all, we talk about ourselves. We're human beings. So uh, I like to say, you come from a dysfunctional culture, so do I. You come from a dysfunctional family, so did I. The skills I'm teaching you are the same skills I use in my marriage every day. And on the days my wife, Belinda, and I don't use them, we look just as ugly as you two. People love hearing that from a therapist, by the way. So we're in the mud with you. I'm more like a 12-step sponsor. I speak from the authority of my own relational recovery. That's a very powerful tool that most therapists throw away. You know, for me to look at you and say, I used to be you. I used to be depressed like you. I used to loathe myself like you. I used to fight all the time like you. And I don't anymore. And let me tell you two things. One is, it's better to be this than that. And two is, if I can do it, you can do it. So let's get started. So we lose that neutrality. Also, we lose the neutrality of not taking sides. When I first learned couples therapy, the cardinal rule was, thou shalt not take sides. You have to be even-handed, 50-50. Particularly, you don't take sides with a woman against a man. If you did that, you had to go to your supervisor and talk for a while about your mother and then get straightened out. So we take sides. Not all problems are 50-50. And I have to say, not always. There are lots of role reversals, but quite often, we side with the woman because it's not an even playing field. Women are the ones who are dissatisfied with relationships. Women are the ones who are probably listening to this podcast. Women are the ones who are buying the self-help books. Women are the ones who drag men into therapy because women have changed and men by and large are just at the beginning of change. Mm -hmm. And the bar has been raised. Women don't need marriage the way they did, like in Jane Austen's day, say. And they want what I call a real intimate marriage. And the paradox is that across the board, and it's, it's better if you're younger, but across the board, women want more emotional intimacy from men than most men have been socialized to deliver and sometimes even want. And so what I say is, uh, look, I believe in intimacy. Intimacy is a great thing. It's good for your physical health. It's good for your mental health. It's good for your kids. It'll keep you living longer. It's a terrific thing. So what the woman is asking for, I agree with. Her delivery may suck and need a little work. But what she's wanting from the guy, you know, the biggest response to women's increased desire for intimacy has been a backlash. Frankly, if women would just go back to the 50s, all would be well. But I don't want women to stand down from their demands. I want men to stand up and meet them. Hmm. That's beautifully put. And you wrote, um, we did a Q&A with you about men struggling with intimacy, which m maybe made me cry. I will admit, but what, I love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but what what is it? You know, and as we think about our husbands, we think about our fathers, we think about the boys that we may raise. What's the stumbling block? Well, one of the things I say, and this is an old word. You know, it's back in favor now. But for a while, if you said the word patriarchy, everybody would yawn, and if you say the word feminism, people would run out of the room. But in the current environment, it's it's a big topic again. Look. In order to, the personal is political, in order to lead men and women into intimacy, you have to lead both out of traditional gender roles, patriarchy. The patriarchy wasn't built for intimacy. It was built for production and consumption and stability. Nobody cared about an intimate marriage, you know, 70, 80 years ago. It's a brand new historical demand. And so the essence of women being nice and kind and voiceless, what the feminist movement has been working on for 50 years, knocks them out of intimacy. And for men, the essence of traditional masculinity to this day is invulnerability. The more invulnerable you are, the more manly you are, the more vulnerable you are, the more a sissy you are. And, you know, as Benet Brown and everybody else has been writing about lately, we humans connect through vulnerability. So... The masculine role and being intimate are at odds with each other. One of the things I say, Harry comes to my office and I say, Harry, you're a statistic, man. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of you being dragged to offices like mine to learn how to open up and be more emotional and be more connected. I, I can't blame all of your mothers for this. You know, this is a social thing that's going on. You are being asked to be more intimate than the, see, the very things that you learn as a boy 
not be expressive, not be emotional, not be dependent. You, there's research that says that boys stop expressing emotion. You know how old? Three, four, five. Mm. They Hard still have it, but they've learned the code. They know better than to open their mouths and, and express it. So the very things that made you a quote unquote good man when you were on your journey from boyhood to manhood will by today's standards ensure that you're a lousy husband. There's a role disjuncture and it takes oftentimes leadership from a therapist or somebody outside of the system to help men move beyond their childhoods and open up. When these couples come into your office on the verge of divorce, would you say that's like the underlying wound a majority of the time? Is this just lack of intimacy? Well, somebody said there are two kinds of uh, couples in the world. There are distant couples and fighting couples. Hmm. There are couples that are distant and there are couples that clobber each other or there are couples where one person clobbers the other. Uh, it's my job to figure out which of those three it is quickly and then deal with it. One of the other differences in RLT than traditional therapy is that traditional therapy, self-help, uh, the great Oprah Winfrey herself, uh, all have dealt with helping people come up from the one down of shame, from the inferiority of shame. And particularly if you're going to work with men, but with both sexes, really, I focus on helping people come up from the one down, but also helping people come down from the one up, from superiority, from what we call grandiosity, looking down your nose at people, being contemptuous, uh, being above the rules and being entitled. And grandiosity is just as big a problem in helping people move into intimacy as shame is. But it's been largely neglected by the field. Mm, that's really interesting. And how often when people come with either shame or grandiosity, are they conscious of it? Or is part of your job in getting involved and taking sides, like the reflection back of what they are putting out there? Absolutely. It's my job. And that's another difference between RLT and other therapies. There are three phases, if you will, of RLT. The first is loving confrontation. I call it joining through the truth. Look, this is exactly what you're doing to blow your own foot off. This is a dysfunctional stance that you've adopted. Can I give you an example of a yes, dysfunctional please. stance? Okay. Angry pursuit is an oxymoron. God damn it, get off your fat ass, get off the couch, get over here and love me now. Rarely works. <laughs> I can't imagine why. Yeah. One, one of the things I say, particularly to women, is, uh, listen, I have bad news for you. Uh, complaint is not seductive. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> but that's a dysfunctional stance. The content is about, I wish you were closer, but the, con but the process actually pushes your partner away, lose the anger. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first order of business is me making clear to you in a way you don't see exactly what you're doing that's self-defeating in your relationship. Mm -hmm. The second phase is going back to your family, that school of relationships called your family of origin, and figuring out where this came from. What did you adopt, adapt to? Uh, I was just talking to one of your staff five minutes ago, and she was telling me that she was overwhelmed by her husband's emotionality. I said, oh, you're a distancer. Well, yeah, I'm a distancer. Oh, you operate behind walls. Yeah, okay, I operate behind walls. And then uh, the next question was, well, who was the overly emotional one in your family? My mom. And how did you deal with your mom's emotionality? Well, I kind of warded her off. Okay, well, that's where you learned to do it. And that became your template for how to have a relationship. So we take it back to where it came from. And that often is very emotional for people, as you might imagine. Is that awareness of like walling off your mom, is that enough or is there additional sort of bringing stuff out that needs to happen or, or reconditioning? Like how do you, is it just knowing the pattern breaks the pattern? No, oh, this is great. Well, that brings me right to my third phase, which is education. You have to teach somebody how to do it differently. And uh, I differ from a lot of trauma work right now. A lot of trauma people think you remove the trauma and people will just naturally know how to be intimate. Mm -hmm. But not in this culture, baby. This is an addictive, narcissistic, patriarchal culture. We don't teach our sons and daughters the skills of intimacy, but we have great ambitions for intimacy. People need to learn how to speak up with love, 
how to listen with generosity and not defensiveness, how to repair when things go off the rails. These are all skills that I teach every day in my office. Mm -hmm. So the first is confrontation, loving confrontation. The second is going back to the roots where it comes from. And then the third is re-education. How do you find that you need to do this with people? Like if someone comes to you, I guess you have a two two day intensive. Like, can this be learned that quickly? Well, I, I send almost everybody back home uh, with a pretty elaborate treatment plan. You have to continue couples therapy. Uh, and or you need to go to 12 step, you need a medication consult, you need a men's group, you need a trauma, you need to do trauma, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And my informal sort of follow through, we haven't done formal outcome studies, is the people who follow through with the recommendations hold their progress. Mm -hmm. And people who don't follow through, they'll keep it for like six months, maybe a year, and then they tend to lose it again. We'll have more of Elise's conversation with Terry Real in a minute. In the meantime, let's talk about one of our partners. Here at Goop, we abide by the thesis of making every choice count. We believe that resources are limited, money, time, materials, and that there's no reason to have a bad meal or go to a ho-hum yoga class or buy a dress that you never wear that taunts you from your closet. You know, that dress that doesn't look good on you, but it's too expensive to give away. Those dresses are the worst. And that's where Stitch Fix comes in. It's the perfect antidote for women who don't like to shop or don't have time to shop or who have always wanted a personal stylist to pick flattering pieces that they will actually wear. I just went through the process of signing up for a Stitch Fix account and it's easy and fun. You enter all your basic size details, pick collages that best reflect your taste, select some of your favorite brands and stores to give the stylist a sense of what you're comfortable spending, and then they do the rest for you. You can choose your frequency from every few weeks to once a quarter, and they'll send you a box of five pieces that they know will fit and flatter you. There's no subscription required. You simply ship back anything that you don't want to keep, and they even pay for shipping and returns. Get started now at stitchfix.com goop, and you'll also get 25% off when you keep all five items in your box. That's stitchfix.com slash goop to try Stitch Fix today. Stitchfix.com slash goop. Okay, let's get back to our chat with Terry Real. And for people who are, you know, let's say on the whole, I may or may not be talking about myself, but on the whole in really healthy relationships, but you have these moments of deterioration. Like what are, when you look at, it's probably not as interesting, but when you look at couples who tend towards being primarily happy, like what do you see as the eroding factors that might actually end up in your office? Yeah. Well, first I want to tell you that moment of darkness uh, is dark. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about what I call normal marital hatred. <laughs> and I've been going around the country talking about that for 20 years, and not one person has said, hey, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> normal marital hatred. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, right. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> normal marital hatred it does not mean you're in a bad relationship. It means you're in a real relationship. All relationships are a rhythm of harmony, disharmony, and repair, closeness, disruption, and a return to closeness. We know this from infant observational research. The baby is molded in the mother's arm, you know, a little noodle. Then there's gas or a noise or hunger, and the baby goes nuts, and the mother goes nuts. That's the disruption phase. And then the pacifier is accepted, or the gas passes, and the baby goes back to being a noodle again. This is the natural rhythm of all relationships. And our culture doesn't give people the, the skills come in from moving from disharmony back into repair. Mm. That's where you have to keep your wits about you. And our culture doesn't teach girls and boys the skills to do that. Our culture doesn't even acknowledge that disrepair exists. Mm. You know, it's all supposed to be straight harmony. It's like a good body is a 17 year old body and a good sex life is like the way you were in the first three months of your relationship. It's all like, 100%, you know, up there. But the guts of relationship is going through the darkness and colliding with it. Mm. But one of the things I say, if I may, is 
uh, and I have a soft spot in my heart for this in my own life as well. We long for divinity. We, we want a god or goddess who's never going to let us down. And we're stuck with a bozo who's just as, you know, limited as we are. And it's actually the collision of your partner's imperfections and yours that makes for the stuff of intimacy. That's the guts of it. Mm-hmm. And it drives you deep with each other. I wouldn't want a perfect relationship. It would be boring after a while. Mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of people fight for entertainment. Um, <laughs> well, but... <laughs> a lot of people fight because it's the only intensity they have with each other. Yeah, which I think is, I've heard other people remark on that. I think that's really, that's interesting. But to back up, before to something you said, which is that moving into repair and and just to quote, to cite my own relationship, that's where my husband really struggles. He doesn't know, he can't even acknowledge that maybe he needs to make it right. I essentially like get tired of, I'm like, this is getting boring, the sort of like nice movement around each other when we're having, when we're not in harmony. And I sort of start the conversation, but like, what are the, how do you crack spoken that like a, Spoken like a woman. Say, exactly. Hey, you would come forward and, and I talk about what I call fierce intimacy. Mm. It's taking each other on. It's really understanding that it, swallowing it and it, telling yourself that you're compromising when in fact you're settling. Mm. Uh, you asked earlier, what makes a good relationship go south? That does. When you stop really taking your partner on, passion is the first casualty. Mm. Your your aliveness dries up, your generosity dries up, pleasure dries up, you're not as interested in pleasing him, and resentment starts to build, like rust, like cancer. So uh, my message to particularly women is uh, dare to rock the boat, go for it. Mm. Don't swallow it because uh, you're going to wind up resenting it and it's going to come out sideways. Mm, it's interesting. And can you, I mean, clearly you can walk back from that, but I, I mean, that I'm sure probably resonates with every single person who is listening to this, that those moments of resent, seething resentment and just like, it's funny. I always quote the movie, The Breakup. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there is this moment with Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn about the dishes. And Uh. he is, he's sort of like, she wants him to help her clean the kitchen. Obviously he doesn't. And he's like, you essentially, why didn't you ask me? And she's like, I don't like, I want you to want to do the dishes. Oh yeah. And I feel like that's also like a threaded of just like, can't you just meet me where I am intuitively, wholeheartedly? No. What I hear from women all the time is uh, the the catchphrase is I want a real partner. I I talk to men about what I call privileged obliviousness. It's it's a millennial old privilege for men. You know, the kind of guy who says, hi, hon, steps over the pile of stinking diapers and gives his wife a kiss, doesn't even notice that they're there. That's a male thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women will say, well, if I tell him exactly what to do, he'll do it, but he never notices. That's a tough one because that goes back a long, long way. Women have been in charge of domestic life and men just haven't been for Mm -hmm. centuries. So... It's going to take a while for men to develop yeah. that consciousness. And and the other manifestation of that, I think, is, and my husband and I both work, and we have two young children, and but it's the learned helplessness, oh, you yeah. know, and just not wanting, like, really consciously trying to not, yes, of course, it's so much easier if I just do it all myself, but I will not. Like, I am not going to enforce any more learned I heard, helplessness. I, I heard a self-described feminist uh, comedian once, this is back when people were smoking, and uh, it was <laughs> (laughs) long time ago. I'm dating myself. Anyway, she says she went on a date, you know, and about her fourth or fifth date, they were out for a weekend at a hotel. And the guy walked in the hotel room and said, we're the ashtrays, hon. (laughs) 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 Not what I know. (laughs) But that's, uh, yeah. It's better with younger men. Yeah. All of this is better. The younger you are, the more feminist you are. All of these Millennial. I'm a great fan of millennial uh, young men. They've mm-hmm. all been raised by feminist mothers, and millennial men are, are by and large more sensitive and progressive. Baby boomers are in deep, deep trouble. D- d- divorces, I think, doubled in baby boomers over the last 20 years. It, to me, it's clear as day what's going on. You have uh, kind of 20th century men with 21st century women. 
and the, the women are just fed up with it. Most divorce, 70% of divorce is instituted by women. Mm. That doesn't totally surprise me. And so just thinking about our and our own children, I guess, is the main is one of the keys, just like letting them, encouraging them to continue to emote. Oh, absolutely. Not just encouraging them, but insisting on it. I want both men and women to hold the bar high for their boys, really insist on connection and relation. I argue really strongly in all three of my books against this myth that in order to, quote-unquote, turn a boy into a man, he has to separate from his mother and he has to be uh, autonomous and only a man can turn a boy into a man, which completely disempowers single moms, lesbian moms. The research is clear. These people do just... It takes an adult to turn a child into an adult. My message to mothers in particular is hold on to your sons. This whole separation... You have to renegotiate an immature relationship to a more mature relationship, leave them, leave them more room, sure, be more independent. But this whole metaphor of having to leave the relationship in order to find yourself is patriarchal nonsense. You know, Bambi, for Christ's sake, starts with the death of the mother. I mean, all boys' tales start with the death of a mother. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's completely unnecessary. Down with the patriarchy. Up with wholeness. Thanks so much for joining our interview with Terry Real today. You can learn more about his work at terryreal.com and at goop.com slash the podcast. I'm so glad Terry decided to break some traditional therapy rules, and I particularly love him for this quote. I don't want women to stand down from their demands, but men to stand up and meet them. Now to this week's Ask Me Anything. When you started your website and it was purely content, where did all the content come from? Did you write everything? Asks Holly. Pretty much, Holly. I had a lot of questions that I wanted answered and I pretty much wrote everything. I had a fantastic woman named Eliza helping me and she started to write some of the content too. But for a long time, it was pretty much me. Have a question? Drop us a line at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for this week's episode of the Goop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share with your friends. To keep up with new episodes, just hit subscribe. And for more info, head over to goop.com slash the podcast. See you next week.